Really at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, what problem is that product solving? If you're going to be leading out there in the jungle with your, your new product, like what's the first thing that we would want to lead with when we're talking about this product? You're listening to Campaign Brief, presented by Wondertree Media. I'm CJ Thomas, and I'm sitting down with marketing industry leaders to hear their stories, strategies, and lessons learned that you can use to stand out and grow your brand. Hey, what's up everyone? In this episode, I'm sitting down with Mark Picotta. Mark is the CEO and co-founder of LaunchBoom, a full service product launch agency that consistently delivers six and seven figure product launches for its clients through crowdfunding. Now, if you're not launching a product through crowdfunding, don't worry, there's still a lot of marketing gold in this episode. In our conversation, we get into things like product positioning and why the positioning is so critical to get right, not only for launch, but marketing after you've launched. We also dive into some ways that you can actually test various elements of your positioning and even the product itself in the pre-launch phase using small marketing investments. And we dive into their strategy for how you can build a highly qualified community of potential buyers before you launch. So that way, when you actually launch, you get that initial momentum right off the bat. So there's a lot we get into. Please enjoy this episode with Mark Picotta. Just to give a little bit of context so people sort of know what you do and specifically kind of where your background is, can you kind of shed some light on what LaunchBoom is? And even I think something that's fun is how you guys even came to be LaunchBoom, sort of that evolution there. Want to kind of give a little bit of background sure. there? Yeah, absolutely. So so first off, LaunchBoom, what we do is that we help entrepreneurs, business owners launch their products on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. It's basically it in a nutshell. But we didn't start that way. I mean, you know my story a little bit, but um, actually started about eight and a half years ago. Um, met two of my co-founders, and so we said, all right, we're in business. We called that company Label Creative. Flash forward about three years later, actually it was about three, three and a half years later, we had done all types of work, website design, branding, video production, worked with a lot of cool different brands. But how we got to Launch Boom was that Along the way, of course, doing random projects, we had the chance to do a crowdfunding campaign. So actually our first client ever when we started uh, Label Creative was for a company called Aqua Design Innovations. And so we launched on Kickstarter, helped them launch it, and it did, I think, around $75,000. And so we're like, wow, this is, this is crazy. Another one of our clients saw it still at Label Creative um, and said, hey, I want to launch. But they, they said, let's do on Indiegogo. So we're like, okay, sure. It's like very similar to Kickstarter. Launched there, did 102000 then Kevin came back to us and said, hey, I have the new version of the EcoCube called the EcoCube C, and I wanna relaunch on Kickstarter. And this is about like a year later. Did that, did 375,000. And we're like, this is crazy. You know, like we had never seen anything like this. Had a ton of fun doing it. And about the same time, we're like, we, we don't really see where Label Creative is gonna be going, you know? And we wanted something that, um, where we could provide even more value for our clients, more value for us. Um, Something that we saw as being more scalable of a business. And we're like, crowdfunding seems to be that thing. So long story short, within the course of about four to five months after kind of coming up with this idea of wanting to rebrand Label Creative, we brought on a new partner and then we went full steam ahead with, with LaunchBoom. I'd love to sort of talk about then, obviously what you guys do is you launch products and you're phenomenal at that. Thanks. So let's kind of dive into, do you want to give a little bit of background on sort of how you guys approach a product launch? I'd love to just kind of start talking about how do we take a great, if someone has a great product idea, how do you take that and actually turn that into a successful launch? Sure. Yeah, sure, sure. So first off, like we, we work with uh, physical products and consumer products. So if you look at Kickstarter and Indiegogo, there's actually a lot of different categories. Um, and it's not just like physical consumer uh, hardware products. People have film projects and people trying to bring restaurants to life or all different types of things, really. But our, our niche, so we even, we've kind of like niched further down even in the Kickstarter and Indiegogo space is, is just on the B2C um, physical product side, just because we've seen that the system that we've created has worked really, really well for that. 
Um, but the reason why I'm going through this is because at the beginning, we were just like when we started Label Creative, we were taking in anyone that would give us the money to do this. You know, we said, sure, if you guys want to pay for it and go through it with us, like we're going to try our best to make you have the best product launch. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't really know how well it's going to do. You know, we may have thought we knew, we may, may have thought in our gut that, hey, this product's going to do well. But once you start spending money on advertising and start actually building up an email list and starting to try to get customers, um, you find out really quickly if there's actually um, some type of product market fit. So we had some really big successes, but we also had some really big failures right when we started. And so pretty quickly, we pivoted to a model where, you know, I, I, CJ, if you came to me and said, hey, I want to give you 50 grand to do this product launch. I would say, no, we're not going to do that. I said, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to test your product in the market. So that's why we came up with a program called Test Boom. So this is where all of our clients that come into us, where this is usually about like four to six months before they would want to launch. We're going to test your product in the market with much smaller budgets. We only use $2,000 to spend. We spend some money on Instagram and Facebook advertising and start to see if people actually have any interest in the product. How we do that is that we send them to a landing page, we have them opt in. Then we also give them the opportunity to put down a deposit to basically reserve the product before it launches. We found that, you know, if you're pulling out your credit card, you're a much more qualified uh, person than someone that just gives their email. So we take, we do that program to essentially um, really find the people that are, are going to have, you know, the most success when it comes to uh, their Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign. And not only that, it's it's for them to see, you know, is this going to be a good fit for working with us? Because we approach it as a partnership. So we want people to come in, we give them some data, then we can have an intelligent conversation whether or not we think we should move forward into the full product launch together. So let's say you get through the test. That's when we, we start to keep creating the assets, the campaign page video, the campaign page, the campaign page uh, video. We start to continue to build a list. Then once we get to the actual launch, that's when we... Uh, launch and have what we call a launch boom. So the whole the whole idea behind this is that we're trying to build up a community of people before you launch that are interested in buying your product so that when you actually launch your campaign on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you essentially know that it's going to be a successful campaign. So you set a goal on Kickstarter, let's say of $25,000, you use that email list to then blow past the goal immediately. And the cool thing about Kickstarter and Indiegogo is that they have tens of millions of unique, unique people on there looking for cool cool stuff. But it's kind of like, you know, Google, where if you don't get in the top three rankings, you're not going to get any of the traffic. So on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, there's thousands of projects on there. You want to be a very popular project. You'll rise up to the top and then you'll start to actually get free traffic. So that's kind of in a nutshell. And then we just continue to scale through um, Indiegogo in demand is another platform and then also e-commerce. Um, but we try to make this as you know, data driven as possible from the beginning of testing to actually getting to the launch to post as well. And we're looking for long-term relationships as well. I would say like our biggest bread and butter and where we put most of our importance is like upfront on the foundation. So, you know, it's, it's like positioning the product in the market, trying to convey the value of this product to the target audience. And then that target audience we want to communicate directly to them during the pre-launch phase. The whole point is that we have this big group of people that, you know, on day one, we're going to send out an email to them and they're going to go to the campaign and pre-order the product on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And that's going to shoot us up in the rankings. And th there's a couple more things that happen because of that. If you have a big day one, again, I, I I go back to this concept of like a strong foundation. You you immediately build up like a very strong base for your campaign. So let's say like you raise fifty thousand dollars in one day. You know, let's just say you raise ten thousand. Even just showing some type of traction on your campaign makes it a more um, makes people more likely to want to back it. This is like for sure shown. If you have a campaign that is below its funding goal versus a campaign that's uh, five hundred percent funded. You know, it's like, which one do you want to back or which one do you have more confidence in? It's probably the one that's 500% funded because that shows that it's ex extremely popular. You're wondering why are all these other people backing this thing? Um, so that helps a lot for increased conversions. And then also uh, press, which is also a huge, huge source of traffic for these Kickstarter Indiegogo campaigns. A lot of them won't even write about campaigns anymore until they're, until they're funded. How do you actually go about building that community? I mean, it sounds like you're running ads, like you said, for pre-order. 
Um, what is it that incentivizes someone to become a part of that community? Yeah, for sure. So, so first off, we're using uh, we're advertising on Facebook and Instagram. I mean, it's they're all one platform. Um, you know, we've tried some other platforms. I mean, Facebook and Google are are essentially it when it comes to advertising these days. Um, but we've just found that Facebook and Instagram as social type advertising works really, really well for building communities and especially crowdfunding. Um, so that's where we advertise. And what we're doing is that we're, we're sending them to a marketing funnel. And I mean, it's really quite simple. I'll just break it down. So the landing page, the idea is that, you know, of course we're trying to convey the value of the product, but the call to action on that landing page is for them to opt in and join our launch list. Why they do that is because they know that they are, or we tell them that they are going to be notified first when we launch and get access to the best discount. How Kickstarter Indiegogo works are the best way to use those platforms when it comes to incentivizing people to get in early is that uh, something that we like to call reward stacking, meaning it's, it's actually really similar to um, uh, ticketing or events. People do this all the time. Like you have a, you know an early bird or, or super early bird, early bird, and all these things have limited quantities or it's even uh, a limited amount of time. So on both Kickstarter and Indiegogo, you can do that. You can say there's only gonna be 100 um, super early bird uh, discounts available on the first day. Um, or maybe you say it's only available until midnight on the first day. So the ability for them to know first or get in on the first day, there's a huge incentive there because they may, you know, in some cases save quite a lot of money. You know, we launched one um, a couple of weeks back called uh, Oh Garden Smart. And I think we did around 150,000 the first day. Um, but the difference in pricing, this thing is $550, but it's going to retail for 1,100. Um, but the different pricing on the first day versus even the third day was somewhere around like 50 or hundred bucks. So people can save quite a bit of money just by getting on those, those initial launch lists. And do you find that there's a lot of educating of the consumer to do to actually convey that value or is that pretty intrinsic to where they kind of see that? Yeah. I mean, it, it does depend a little bit on the product itself. So really at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, what problem is that product solving? So if you have a really simple, I like to say like a problem solution combination, the education needed is, is like nothing, you know? Yeah. So an example of that is, um, a product we launched called neck hammock and amazing product. And when you have a simple product, uh, problem solution combination, that's not a bad thing at all. A lot of times that's, that's great. That's fantastic. I mean, at the end of the day, what neck, neck hammock is solving is, uh, neck pain. So, I mean, if you come to a page and it says, you know, this will solve your neck pain in, in 10 minutes or less, you know, you immediately understand the value that this product is trying to convey. And you also have a very like visceral idea of what that problem is. It's the neck pain that you're experiencing every day. So that's like a really easy problem solution combination where I think even that landing page, which it performed really well, was extremely short. Like we kept it uh, more like a, what we would call like a squeeze page. Um, just headline, copy, imagery, and, and call to action. That was basically it. Ogarden, let's just go back to the example I just used, uh, much more expensive product. It, what it is is a, um, it's indoor hydroponics unit. You can grow 90 um, fruits and vegetables indoor, and it self-waters, and it's a really cool product. But with that one, you know, it's, it's a much bigger, uh, there's more education required, like you were talking about, because... It's, it's not as much of a, there is a problem it's solving. Obviously it's like people want to be able to grow fruits and vegetables at home. Um, but that's not as big of a problem, let's say, or as a simple problem that people can relate to as like a neck hammock, which is like this neck pain. Um, this is more of a, definitely more of like a luxury product, um, that takes a lot more convincing. But even with that said, I, I do want to denote that it's important to um, know that you don't have to do all the education on the front end. So, you know, we take an approach where it's, it's an, just enough education. So you want, you don't want to, of course, deceive or anything like that, but from the ads to the landing page, you don't need to overload them with so much information. Really at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get them in. And what that means is get the lead, get the email. And then from that point, we can start to add more education or give them more education leading up to the launch thing through having private Facebook groups for people to interact with the community, interact with the founders, 
ask questions, give them early access to the campaign page so they can actually, again, ask questions, understand what's going on. So it's something to take into account with these product launches. You don't, you don't, there's a, there is such a thing as too much information up front because especially in social media advertising, when people are scrolling through their feeds, you know, and they see an ad, of course, if you got their attention, that's great because this is a, an attention game. Um, they don't want to spend too, too much time actually going through this whole thing. Like you want to do enough to convince them to give the email to then go to the next stage. Right. And I think even just looking at this, uh, at this approach as a whole, this applies just in terms of launching a product in general, not necessarily Kickstarter and Indiegogo, right? Like, True. especially hearing yeah. you talk about the importance of testing. I mean, obviously with social media marketing and advertising and things like that now, there's so much, it cuts out so much of the guesswork. True. And I think yeah. that that's so powerful when it comes to not just launching a product, but developing it in the first place. The way that we approach it is we're trying to essentially challenge some assumptions or or test some hypotheses, that's a better way of putting it, that we have about the product. So the very first thing that we're doing is that we're, uh, and at the end of the day, all we're really doing is um, is positioning this product correctly in the market. So we're, we're trying to come up with, we call them angles, like what are some different things, different ways that we can visit, position this product in the market and test to see how the market actually responds to that. So there's kind of multiple parts of that too, where you have, you know, angle, let's, um, let's, uh, give an example of like, uh, William Painter sunglasses here in, in San Diego, you know, we, we, they've done seven product launches themselves. They're good friends of ours. And we've done about four of them with them. Um, because they didn't find out about us until, until later. Um, but anyway, so we did, we did those product launches and, and so for some of their sunglasses, let's say like an angle that you could take is, um, people always like break their sunglasses, right? Well, the angle with William Painter that we may want to test to see like which one's most popular is like these sunglasses are indestructible. Um, maybe another one is, uh, you know, these sunglasses have like a lifetime guarantee. Um, you know, maybe another one is around, um, losing the sunglasses. Like they'll actually replace your sunglasses for 50%, um, 50% off, you know? So you start to actually think of like, what are these, um, different angles that we can test to see which ones resonate the most with the audience and what you're trying to get to is what we call the tip of the spear. So it's like, if you're going to be leading out there in the jungle with your, your new product, like what's the first thing that we would want to lead with when we're talking about this product. So maybe for William Painter, it's this, the fact that they're, they're made from aerospace grade aluminum. So these things are freaking indestructible, you know, and it's pretty much what it is a lot of times, uh, for those guys. So figuring out and testing these angles is a huge part of this. And then the other part of this is the target market. Like, so you can have the best tip of the spear possible for these sunglasses and say it's indestructible, but if you're targeting the wrong people, then it's, it's not going to matter at all. So we also come up with who are different types of people or personas that we think would resonate, you know, the most with this whether that be world travelers or entrepreneurs, you know, and sure there may be some overlap between these audiences, but it's good to th start to think about, you know, what are these people's interests and things like that. And that's where that matches up really well to Facebook and Instagram advertising, because what you're doing on there essentially is creating audiences based off of people's interests, based off their demographics. Um, and then you can, can target them. I love that approach of testing it beforehand because you're still letting the market inform how you ultimately set up and position this product. Exactly. Every single element of the uh, funnel like that we're putting out there um, is going to tell you some information about um, you know how the market responds to your positioning. The, I think the general thing, like when I try to simplify it for people is that view your funnel at each stage. It's like the ad, then the landing page. In our case, then we give them the, like the reservation page and, and, you know, really understand the metrics at each one of these stages and see, you know, what are these metrics actually telling you and what are some things that you can test, you know, imagery copy to again, imagery copy on the landing page to maybe price point on the reservation page. And you can start to actually collect some data before you go out there and, and launch 
launch your product. Cause once you do that and you put it out there, you know, you, you can change some things. You should always be testing, but it's going to be much more difficult and might as well do it way early on, earlier on than, than later. Yeah. And that's sort of, I guess what I'm taking away from this too, is just kind of really the key is doing it early. And I think a lot of the smartest entrepreneurs and, and companies understand that launching a product, the marketing starts way before the product actually launches. Exactly. Right. And that's yeah. sort of, I think the overall theme here of what we're talking about is getting that marketing going so much earlier in the game. So you have a successful product launch. So you have that alignment when you launch. Exactly. And I, I think the other thing I want to point out here is that, um, yeah, you know, I feel like people or big companies or people think big companies do things like focus groups and, and, uh, well, it's probably like one of the big ones that people always talk about, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with focus groups, but we're much more into the concept of let's actually spend some money and, and see if people are willing to pull out their credit card and, and, and put some money down, you know, e even though we're putting down or having them put down deposits for these products, instead of paying for the entire thing, there still is something much more, um, I guess like real about the the person's interest level when they pull out their credit card online versus especially if you think about the they just saw the product probably 30 seconds ago and they're doing this um, there's some, something much more real about that than you know just talking to someone in a group and asking them like what would they pay for this product or what would they pay um, so it's it's having them put their money where their mouth is essentially and letting letting the data speak for for itself um, I think is something that is really powerful about the process that we're, that we've created. And I mean, I always encourage every single entrepreneur, whether they're working with us or doing it themselves to have some type of way of, of having people put, you know, put some money down. Um, even I think of, of like, you know, Tesla with, with the model X, right. You're not the model X, sorry. The, um, what was the, what was uh, the model car? three model three? Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. The mass market one. Um, you know, they, they, they had everyone put down deposits, which were much more than we're having people put down a dollar. But even the fact that people are putting down some money on there, like that showed enormous demand for that product. Yeah. Um, and it allowed them to plan better um, um, for that product actually coming out. That's awesome. And so, I mean, even on the data side of things, obviously data plays such a huge role here. And this is a big piece of what we're talking about. But I think just in the creative world and the world of marketing and advertising, data is such a big thing. And it's so available to us now where like, you know, 30 years ago, like you were saying, it's focus groups, right? Let's yeah. get a handful of people. And now you can get real data, easy, cheap, in many, in many cases free, even there are ways to do that. How do you see the role, though, of data in terms of the actual ideation of creativity, of coming up with ideas? Um, because I think initially it might seem like they're conflicting, but maybe data can support the creative ideas in that ideation phase. For sure. I mean, they're all interconnected. Like we don't try to, uh, we don't compartmentalize all these different areas. We view it as being just one thing, meaning that the data influences our creative decisions, our creative decisions influence the data. Um, and it's all just like one organism, I guess, you know, um, you know, during the testing phase, like we were talking about at the beginning, it's, we're using our creativity to come up with, uh, our initial hypotheses for how we want to position this product. Uh, again, like how we want the angles we want to take the target, the, the, the markets that we or the audiences that we want to target. Um, so that's, that's all like the creative process right there. Like creative juices are flowing. We're talking to our team about this. We're using our best judgment and even past data, you know, we're doing research and we're looking at maybe our past campaigns that might have applicable or overlap in terms of audiences. And then we're using that to, to make our, you know, our best judgment or put our best foot forward. But then you, you step back from it, you detach yourself from it. You let it go out into the world, do its thing, test, see how it does and then come back at, and look at it without an ego, look at the data and say, you know, okay, what is this telling me? Um, how true is this, you know? And then taking that data and doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. I mean, essentially that creative process should never stop. I mean, it's, we do it, we call it test boom in this case, but even if someone gets past the testing process, we're continuing to 
use creativity to come up with ideas, to then test, to then use the data to come up with new ideas and just continue to do the same thing over and over again. One of the reasons I really thought it would be valuable to have a conversation with you too, especially in talking about this interplay of the data and the creative and really making these decisions at such an early stage is just, I think you have a really good ability to bring a team around that. And it's not always easy when you're in such an early stage or when you're having this sort of very like analytical approach where you have to sort of remove emotion, but you're also dealing with creative and ideas where let's face it, like we can get married to our ideas as much as we don't want to, we get (laughs) married to our ideas. So, I mean, I'm just curious, like from your standpoint, what does it look like for you building a team where you're sort of having to balance out and ensure that, you know, you mentioned not compartmentalizing data and creativity and what does that sort of look like in terms of building the best team? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we have, so just in terms of how our, like our team is comprised, we have about 20 people. We have 20 people. We just hired two more, uh, on Monday, super pumped about, um, but we have, we definitely have people that are, are more focused on certain areas. Like it's, uh, what I'm trying to get at is like, not everyone is, is definitely not experts in all different things across like the creative component or the videography or photography and then, and then ads. But at the same time, we try to make our team as cross-disciplinary as possible. Um, meaning that, you know, when we talk about things, um, we're not afraid to discuss the data with the person that is taking the photography. Like, it's just known from the beginning that, hey, we're going to let you know how your photography performed, not just from like a visual aesthetic standpoint, but also like how it performed like on the, the landing page or the ad or whatever. And we want the, we train or we look for people that are interested in that, you know, and, and we also give feedback about that. Like, this is something that you should be looking at. So we have, as an example, um, uh, Sarah, who's been with us for a long time, she's been helping us, um, recently she was helping us make some, some ads like video ads as well. Um, she was asking, I, I love this. She was asking in our Slack channels, you know, like, let me know how it performs. You know, and like, I want to go in there and understand like when there was drop off on the ad, because you can see that on Facebook, um, how people are actually responding into it in terms of, you know, click through rates in terms of, uh, opt in rates in terms of, you know, cost per lead cost per reservation. And that's the type of stuff that, um, yeah, we encourage. So I guess quite simply it's encouraging, making it always part of the conversation. Um, and also, part of it is, is hiring people based off of, uh, like their values that they have. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of a buzzword, but it kind of comes down to the culture, right? Of yeah. the company. And, yeah. and I mean, it sounds like really hiring for that culture that supports ultimately what is the end goal here? The end goal is to have successful product launches, right? I, exactly. And not have everyone necessarily feel good about their ideas. I mean, obviously we all want to feel good about our ideas, but again, it's sort of removing that emotional attachment to it. And I think it's, it's really, I commend you for how you and your team have been able to build that culture to where there's that open feedback loop and you're able to just sort of detach and everyone seems so laser focused on what is the end goal how do we ultimately lead this to a successful launch? Like, I love that example you gave of your photographer, you know, saying like, hey, let me know how these work. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> incredible. That's awesome to have that much buy-in from someone where, you know, it's, it's really, I wanna create amazing photographs, but having that next level buy-in of, I wanna create amazing photographs that contribute to the mission. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like redefining, or it's not redefining, it's like defining what, amazing photographs mean or like what quality work means like is it just visually appealing or you know aesthetically pleasing or is it aesthetically pleasing plus you know doing you know making someone want to buy the product it's like defining what that is and that's that's huge for this it's like everyone understands that there's something bigger here than just making something look pretty and i think that you know the best creatives in the world are are doing that like they do um, and of course everyone has like a level of ego attached to their work, which I think is great. Like you want to like <laughs> have some connection. It's like this emotional connection to it. But at the same time, um, it's understanding that there are like other things at play here and that you may not know everything and that 
outside data or outside feedback or it's all just feedback um, is going to point you further or point you more towards the truth. I love that, man. Well, dude, I definitely want to uh, be respectful of your time. I appreciate you doing this. And it's been really cool having this conversation. I guess before we wrap, just want to, if anyone wants to kind of find out more about LaunchBoom, what you do, or even learn more about launching products, uh, where can we point them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the easiest way, uh, launchboom.com. Um, honestly, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email at mark, M-A-R-K, at launchboom.com. And also put out a lot of content, not as much content as this guy here, CJ, um, big inspiration to me is, um, but if you do want to see some of our content, just go to launchroom.com and then go to our blog and we have a ton of things on there. The best is probably a guide that I wrote called hacking Kickstarter 2.0 end to end. You could launch your campaign just by following that. So, but yeah, CJ, thanks for having me on, man. It was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. I hope you liked it. I hope you got a lot out of it. If so, it would mean the world to me if you could jump over to Apple Podcasts and leave an honest rating and review for the show. That helps us get this out to more marketing leaders like yourself. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks.